we have this week we have Bobby, who is I'm gonna point the camera over at Bobby. Can you wave for everybody? Bobby is absolutely a professional at this sort of stuff. It's what he does in R and D for a living, which is great. And he's a facilitator for it. So it's very exciting. And he brought a surfboard, which is over over there that we'll be able to take a look at and patch. And if you're paying extra close attention, people at home, it's on top of a CNC milled piece of plywood uh, stand, which is, you know, make something big right there. So Bobby just did two of our week's assignments. <laughs> Show off. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so let's go through the slides are going to be sort of an introduction to composite materials. We're going to talk broadly about them sort of conceptually what's there. There's some methodologies and then we have a fairly hopefully, you know, fingers crossed if everything works well, we should have a fairly tightly defined assignment for the week, which makes it nice and achievable every time that happens. So um, Let's see what we're doing here. And and anybody, as always, but Bobby, especially since you're you're new to this, if there's anything in the slides that seems like it's a bit off or I need corrected in the, the terminology or verbiage, please feel free at any time to jump in and do so. There's there's no, you know, you're very likely much more of an expert at this than I am in any like you are. Let me just be clear. You are more of an expert in composites than I am. But it's as a group that we all move this forward. So uh, composites in general, we're going to go over and talk about composite materials in a few different ways. We're going to talk about what is a composite material, sort of a theoretical background on it. Then we'll look at a few examples that exist out there. And uh, we might get the thumbs up or thumbs down for how much composite material they are. Then we're going to talk about ways to make composites, sort of the different variations of how you could make that happen for yourself. And then we'll talk about how you get started, like what are the what are the next steps? And so as we go through all of these different pieces, um, it's it'll be nice to see how this runs. There's definitely an approachable scale to this, and then there's also a very very deep scale. You can you can be a researcher in aerospace and build full on airplanes like the seven seventy seven. You know, full size actual airplanes that people fly internationally are made with composites. So this is something that definitely scales the full range all the way from like hobby composites for fun to really important professional can never fail kinds of composites. So we're gonna try and cover that breadth. Uh, as always, this week is usually its own whole career, but it's good to get started. So composite materials, let's talk about what, what they are in general. If you're talking about composites, the first thing that you want to start to think about is just materials in general. Composite materials are just a subcategory of materials, and every material has its own properties, right? We know we've talked about metal and wood at different times throughout the class. We talked about how uh, 3D printing is great. It's got filament that you can liquefy and sort of ooze into a location, then it'll reharden. And each one of those different materials, whether it's wood or metal or plastic, they all have their own strengths and weaknesses. Wood is really good at being pulled on. Usually metals are good at being pulled on. When we did concrete work, that's really good at being compressed or squeezed. And so when you have these properties in materials, sometimes you get the perfect thing right there on a material that exists for you. And other times you want something to be uh, a little bit different than what it is. You know, very old airplanes had, I think it was aluminum casings on like the, the air and space museum sort of airplanes, the, the big old ones. And now we've got planes that are built out of all sorts of crazy things. And so when you have material properties, it's often the case that you want to tweak these to be exactly what you want versus what, what sort of the menu option is, which leads to sort of the next almost comical idea that you can mash up your properties. And so some mashups are good. Some of them are questionable, definitely. Like Hulk fiction is kind of terrifying down there in the corner. It's funny, but not not quite uh, reasonable. Yeah, the jumping spider owl is kind of fun. The Sonic, the Bart, is is good. The <laughs> I I know I've I've like got a thousand follow up questions to each one of these. The breaking baking bad is pretty good, I think. But but in but in essence, like you're mashing two ideas together, and so people really build cosplay costumes and and like try and blend ideas. 
that built on a larger scale, bridges are a great example of where you'd have sort of a composite structure, a structural composite, where you have metal and, and cement or metal and wood brought together because each brings something to the table. So in the case of the Q bridge, which I've recently learned the name of from this class, uh, the Q bridge is built out of concrete and steel, right? The, the steel cables are in tension, the concrete is in compression. And so those cables are sort of pulling, holding the bridge up and all of that weight is going down through the pillar. So you've got a compression and tension piece there that the old timey bridge to the left has got, it's probably mostly steel, but you've got the, the wooden decking that's gonna be a little bit easier on wheels than if you were driving over metal grates. They may not have been good at building the same kind of uh, cross latching at the time when that was built uh, than we do now. And there are some exceptions to this. When you don't have the ability to, to mix materials, very old bridges or like the Colosseum was built entirely with concrete. The, and always its structures had to be built under compression. It was built in, there was no rebar in like the Colosseum or the Parthenon or any of those very old cement structures that existed from Roman, Roman cement. Uh, their cement mix was only a little different than ours, but all of it was built under compression only because they weren't mixing materials. They were just leveraging the fact that cement is really, and, and stone is really good under compression. So if you can alter your designs and deal with that and in a design sort of sense, you can make more limited materials work. But our goal here is to better understand what happens when you mash up materials sort of on this, uh, on this big scale, it's kind of easy to wrap your head around it. You can point to and see, oh, there's the cables, those are under tension. And then there's the cement part that's under compression. We're gonna draw that down from sort of that large structural scale down to a much smaller, more, uh, more like not molecular, but, but smaller scale for sure. And so we're thinking about materials that are combined to make some sort of a composite that comes together. And there's lots of things that fit this category that are composite materials. And then there's lots of like sub categories within those. Over here are a couple of theoretical ideas, right? You can have laminated sheets, you can have fibers and honeycombs. Um, I, I really liked this list and these graphics to go through it, that you've got composites reinforced by particles. This is more like a concrete with cement. B is composites reinforced by chopped strands. That's a lot like this fiberglass over here. Uh, C is going to be unidirectional composites where all of the strands sort of run in one direction. I'm thinking bamboo flooring kind of thing in that way where it's long stranded bamboo. The D is much more like plywood where you have cross directional or bi-directional where if you think about especially Baltic birch plywood, each layer is wood cut into a thin sheet and the grain runs in one direction along that sheet. In order to make plywood, which is stronger than normal wood for the same weight, they take those, those uh, grains and they run them 90 degrees to each other each time you have a new layer. And because they take the, the grain of the wood and they put it 90 degrees, it's actually much stronger than if you just had it there by itself. So that's the sort of thing that makes for a composite where you're able to leverage properties of materials, even if you're tweaking the same thing in a different ways, you get different structural properties. But then maybe E uh, is, is the most on target composite that we're gonna be thinking about where you've got fabric reinforced epoxy or fabric reinforced plastics, where you're using a fabric along with an epoxy to strengthen each other. And the fabric fibers are good at being pulled on, right? You can pull on a, if you pull the right way onto most garments, they've got some stretch, some give, they can deal with that. Uh, and, and some fibers like, carbon fibers or Kevlar, some things are even better at dealing with that. Fiberglass is good at dealing with being pulled on. Um, and then you can mix that with something that's really good at being squished. So if it gets a weird, complicated compression and tension force acting uh, from a random source, it'll handle it really nicely. And so this is, this is probably where we're gonna spend a majority of our, our energy thinking this week, but certainly by no means does that mean that that's the only composite. And then down here F is this honeycomb core. And if you've ever been to Ikea or accidentally, presumably cracked open one of their tables, they do a lot of this honeycomb interior, interior composites where they want something that looks and feels like wood, um, like it's a solid wood tabletop, but it's really, really lightweight so that people can carry it out of the store without a problem. That's not a big deal to flip it over when you need to do assembly.
Yep. Yeah. Uh, just to repeat for people at home, think about I-beams that need strength on the top and bottom. And the middle is sort of like a wasted space structurally. So the honeycomb can fill it up. And the strength is really where it needs to be on the top and bottom, right? Uh, like for construction, holding up uh, parking garages, that sort of stuff, where it's got, where it's all steel and you've got like a horizontal piece. It's like, it's shaped like an eye and, and that's what the name is. It's got a, a wide piece on top, a wide piece on bottom. And then like a skinny in the in the middle, a skinny structural piece that just just keeps the top and bottom attached to each other. They also sell, the, and it's a little bit more modern. So if you're in a newer house, which is probably not that common in New Haven, they sell like engineered wood I beams that you might see in basements that aren't finished, where there's a solid wood piece in the bottom, a solid wood piece in the top, and then OSB in the middle, which is like the cheapest wood you can possibly get, just to hold those two beams together. So. It, they're putting it in, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're all over the place to, to be able to build materials in a way that's more clever, that maybe makes them cheaper, maybe makes them lighter. There's a whole bunch of ways that you can try and leverage this to manage materials for your benefit. And so we're gonna look at some examples. Like in, instead of talking about this conceptually, here are some more examples, because that's where we were headed anyways. Uh, concrete and rebar is the most common modern one where you've got concrete for compression and rebar to sort of deal with the tension. And there's, there's some really great practical engineering videos that I think I've linked to already where he talks about pre-strained uh, rebar and, and all sorts of things to make that even better for bridges uh, to make sure that they're as strong as can be. Then plywood is another example that's all over the place. Fiberglass, like in this lovely old car advertisement where fiberglass bodies reduce the weight of cars. Early cars would have been mostly entirely metal. And then once you could build with fiberglass, you're, now you're reducing the weight of the car. The sports car is gonna become more possible because you can really reduce the weight of the thing. Uh, increasingly with, with racing items, and I'm sure that Liana can tell us a lot more, carbon fiber is picking up as an even more fashionable material because it's got that real neat looking cross pattern on it usually that you can get to a high polish. So it looks high end and a lot of higher end, I don't spend much time in high end cars, but a fair amount of high end cars from pictures I've seen have this stuff on the dashboard just to prove that they're that space age. Even, even though it's on the dashboard, not really doing much. Uh, so there's all sorts of things like that that you can get to make your, to, the, which is actually higher performance, but in some applications, it's also just for show, which is totally valid. Drywall is an interesting one that you've got that gypsum board, the sort of plaster in between and then paper, which is acting sort of like a tensioner to keep it all together. Um, then you've got airplane bodies that are built. I think that that's an airplane body kind of oven, a nice big curing oven for that sort of a thing. Okay, it's an autoclave, so it'll raise pressure and temperature. And you can do all of that inside that chamber, which is a very, you know, those are things that it's going to be hard to get your hands on in here, but it's a really neat piece to know exists. Casts, I think, are a good example of a, of like a easy to throw together composite material. A little, you know, you think about an eight-year-old who broke their arm, they go to the doctor, they get their, their arm wrapped in a fabric with something that holds it stiff. And then for a few weeks, they have to leave it in that cast for a while while their arm while the bones in their arms mend. Um, this lady's setting some fiberglass. Engineered wood is another good example of, uh, of a composite where instead of having solid wood floorboards, you have an engineered wood floorboard. And it looks like in this case, it's a plywood engineered uh, floorboard, which is great. Most of the time, it's much cheaper to do this with their MDF in the middle. Those are good until they get wet in the core and then the whole thing is shot in a way that really bothers me when it's inside of a place that I live. Uh, but these engineered ones, if you look, they are built in such a way that you can, you can resurface them usually once or twice. So you've got a solid wood top and then plywood underneath. Sometimes hardwood floors need resurfaced. And if they're built like this, you, you could resurface them. And the person who lives on that engineered wood floor may not even know that it's engineered. Whereas with these, any water gets into the seam at all and all of a sudden they're puckering right along the edges. You can totally tell. 
Uh, although I, I don't have a pet peeve at all about that, not even a little. Um, and then an interesting one for composites, this is maybe like pushing the boundary of that a little bit, but is a bimetallic strip where you have two metals and by putting them together side by side, when it heats up the two metals, if they have different thermal expansion rates, the one will extend faster than the other. Like this, the gray one extends faster than the dark gray one. And so then this gray one gets longer, but if you bolt the two together on the ends or really solder them together, then they'll bend. Right? And that's an interesting property that you only get by combining multiple materials together. This is really common in a lot of older thermostats where it would be a spiral of a biometallic strip. And then when the temperature changed, that spiral would expand or contract. Really old ones would then take that biometallic strip and put a little mercury switch on the end. So when the mercury would tip down, it would make contact between two leads. And when it was cooler, it would tip back the other way and the mercury would fall off those contacts. What's up? Sure. Oh, like to rip cut plywood. Um, so the question was, can you rip cut plywood? And I think the, the short answer is that would be harder to do than you think it would, is my guess. But in theory, I suppose it's presumably possible, but I, I, my guess would be, I, I wouldn't bet on its integrity staying together. There's enough shaking. I, I can't imagine there'd be like a catastrophic loss, but I'd say it's probably better to buy the other plywood. So those are just some examples. Any other great examples jumping to mind, Bobby, that I totally missed? Airplane bodies? <laughs> Surfboards, airplane bodies. Um, they're, they're all over the place. It just takes some paying attention to it to see sort of what those, what those pieces are to make sure that you're really looking for uh, all the details. We're addressing a question of can you make cardboard tables? And I'm like, now gonna play commentator and just tell you how this is going. Uh, can you make cardboard tables out of cardboard sheets that you might find discarded somewhere? And if they if they lay up, can you build them strong enough that they'd be like a good tabletop surface? And it looks like Bobby is really pondering this one, wondering how how you'd respond to that. And I think I think he's got it. That you need to have the layers stacked in. You want to keep them bi-directional and you want to treat it like an engineered wood. So you have those sorts of things. Maybe you do cardboard layers in the middle and then maybe like a, a thin MDF sheet on top and bottom, sort of like Ikea pulls off. Yeah. Yep. Sounds like they're still trying to piece out the details, but the, the back and forth banter is hopeful and exciting. They're, they're looking forward. Ooh, cardboard origami furniture store. Ruby just dropped a bomb. This whole thing is, has changed. And it's a local shop. It's exciting. There's, there's definitely some opportunity to build cardboard furniture, which sounds exciting. There's all sorts of... So you can put together your cardboard with all sorts of different things, spray adhesive, wood, uh, wood glue, things, things that won't destroy the cardboard while it's setting. So it's a, an epoxy could do it. You want to have a cure time that doesn't let the cardboard fall apart. You want a, like a short cure time if you're gonna try and attach cardboard to each other because it you know would get mushy and melt. Oh, cardboardorigami.org is what Kate just dropped in the chat. That seems like a fun website. Also, you can do, you can, there's definitely some good examples of cardboard furniture, which is sort of like bordering on these two lessons of make something big and then also common and like composites where you, you'd be able to use paper to build those sorts of things. 
but uh, I think I'm going to stop this back and forth so we can keep the whole thing on track for time. All right, so cool. Let's let's keep going. Um, next up, we're going to do some. We're going to talk about the the ways that you would build a composite. So these are sort of the processes uh, that we're going to talk about with wet layups, mostly focused on resin, but there, we're throwing cement in for good measure, um, cement and concrete. A wet layup is when you have sort of a wet open system where you can just lay down some sort of a, a fibrous material, like in the case of this canoe, it's a fiberglass sheet. And then you, lay, you wipe your epoxy on over top, you brush it on, roll it on, so that it penetrates through that material and covers it. You can imagine built someone who's gone to all the effort of building a wood canoe, right? That would, that's fantastic. And, you, and it looks beautiful, this particular canoe. But you want to make sure that if you're going to have a canoe that you've built, you want to take it out into the water. And in, in that case, you're going to want to make sure that it's watertight and that it's strong. And that as those boards age and stretch and bend, they've got something that bonds them together that keeps it watertight and sealed. So by doing this, you can absolutely lay that fiberglass sheet across the surface. Once it's coated in epoxy, it turns basically clear. So you pretty much lose track of the fact that it's there but it leaves a, a, a hardened shell around the surface that really seals in the entire canoe, which is great. You can also patch vehicles. I don't know what this part is here, but it was definitely a few photos uh, that are public domain that are walking through, how do you patch a hole on a vehicle? And this looks like a Corvette that's being patched in the same sort of way with a fiberglass body that they, they ground off the paint, the enamel and the paint, and then they started to patch the underbody from there. You can even buy entire kit systems just for that. And surfboards and stand-up paddle boards are also great examples. Bobby is hoping to patch his tonight so we can see it, which is very exciting. And then if you're doing concrete and rebar, that also would fall into this composite, composite world because you've got the rebar for tension, the concrete for compression, and it, I don't know, probably fits into this wet layup better than anything else, better than any of the other categories we're about to look at, because it's sort of a wet open system that you're not going to seal in any way while it's, while it's doing its thing. So you're just going to sort of set it there, put the two pieces together, and then let them react, cure, dry, whatever it is, so they come into their own being. This is probably the simplest of the procedures that we're going to look at. Um, it's definitely one that you can do just about anywhere. You need the least equipment to make it happen. But it may not be exactly what works in all of your all of your places. So in all contexts. And so this is a, a neat procedure. There's definitely some space for this. If you've done paper mache or made yourself, uh, you know, your own pinata, this is this is what you were doing on a paper mache sort of scale, where it's paper and glue all sort of mixed together. Some starch in in pinata building, I think. And so you, you do this where you wrap it around a balloon or a few balloons, and then you get a shape that will hold with just those materials. So that's the sort of thing that uh, is, is at the core of this skill. It's something that you probably have done in life, even if you weren't using this kind of terminology for it, um, if, if not. And if you haven't, we just passed April Fool's Day, but a good April Fool's joke for the future is to make yourself a paper mache cast and then send that photo to family and just say, uh-oh, bad day. It's a, it's a good April Fool's joke if you're looking for one. Um, so we've got those. Next up, for more types of wet layups, you can do those and do vacuum bagging on top of it. So this is a neat procedure. This is the one that I, I did to prep for this week with Bobby's help. And I've done uh, just one other time, but it's a neat procedure try and do it every four years, I guess is my goal. And so in here, what this is, is basically the same thing as an open wet layup with the exception of you're using air pressure to hold the material to a shape or to a form. And so vacuum bagging is what we'd like to be able to do with everybody. We've started to seal up. Uh, we got a few cheap bowls filled their insides with foam. And we're hoping that if you're here, maybe we can do some, some vacuum bagging tonight if everything works. And we're we're not certain that it's all gonna work. Right now, we've still got some things in process to see if it's gonna happen. Um, but the, way, the, the fundamental reason that this works is because we live in an atmosphere that's constantly pressing in on you everywhere at 14.7 or 15 PSI, 15 pounds per square inch, which is kind of crazy to think about. 
that you've got, if you think about all of your surface area, just like on the top of your head, all of those pounds pressing down on you, you don't notice it because there's also upward pressure and all sorts of things that are going on. Uh, but if you can remove some of that air, you'll get an inward pressure and that's what will hold your composite to a form. And so that's, that's what we're trying to do here. So in this case, this is a piece of wood that I was looking at in a few other weeks and a few previous weeks. And then we laid down, this is an old dress shirt and then some linen I found in the scraps bag or scraps pile here in Makehaven. We mixed that with epoxy, laid it across and then did some vacuum bagging to hold it all together. When we get to sort of the show and tell phase, we're gonna open it up, see if it even worked. That's still an unknown. We coated the wood last minute with polyurethane uh, and mold release and then crossed our fingers to hope that it would, it would one day come off of that piece of wood. We, it's still an unknown. Um, over here on the left, this is, this is a mountain that I made. This was a mountain that I had uh, climbed, Mount Adams in Washington State. I milled it out of foam on a CNC, not unlike the Gerber, and then did burlap and epoxy on its surface to try and get that structure. I should have milled the inverse of the mountain is what I learned from that experience because you get the nicest finish up against your tool. So there's just a whole bunch of things that you can learn. This is sort of like, I would put this pretty close to molding and casting. And there's some things that you definitely learn more by practicing it. You do it once and you learn things. Like in the case of my mold over here on the right, uh, I learned a lot about darting and cutting darts so that you have your fabric that you're laying down be the right shape. In this case, I tried to do it all in one or two big pieces of fabric. And in the future, I'm definitely gonna do strips so that the strips can be laid down. And when you've got complicated geometry like this depression in the middle, you can see all of those wrinkles. Had I planned better, uh, I would have been able to do this with strips that go across and don't cross where there's, there's wrinkle or there's movement in both dimensions where you've got like double actions going on and you can minimize your amount of wrinkles. So there's some, there's some strategy to doing this. And this is the sort of thing that for an airplane, uh, Bobby says is, is designed very meticulously and then probably CNC cut. So all those pieces fit perfectly exactly where and how you want them. Yep, yeah, nodding yes. What's up? Yeah. I would have, I should have taken the STL that I had. Oh, I would have needed to cut a little hole at the bottom of the mountain so that it could pull the air out. Yeah, probably. And so some of, one of the things with vacuum bagging is that it will, it will pull a little better along the surface than molding and casting will. It's a pretty aggressive vacuum, um, but it does help to have air access in, in the same sort of way. So, whoops, let's head back over to here. Let's see. And so there's all sorts of things, there's all sorts of dynamics to this, but if, you're, if you are a big fan of molding and casting, this is going to feel pretty similar, uh, but perhaps leveled up in its specificity. But it, it's still epoxy and materials and then molds that are happening here. You can see I highlighted with orange circles. This was kept under a vacuum pump with this as a spillover chamber, a way to check on our pressure. And then I have this little access point where I can I'll apply the vacuum into the bag. And it stayed like this for 24 hours for the entire cure time of the epoxy. So that the air pressure was holding it in place the entire time that it cured. And that was true for this one also. What's up? It's, so this is a factoid that I probably should have fact checked more to give you a specific answer on that. But my guess, yeah, the saying is stronger than steel, lighter than aluminum. But it depends on the layup and, and specifics. but it, it apparently depends on all of the factors, the fabric, the epoxy, all of that. Yep, that sounds good. Like the, so in order to make it, in order to hit that tagline, stronger than steel, lighter than aluminum, everything, all the stars need to be aligned just right. Um, it, so it sounds like it's, and then I assume there's even within that, like you can put some folds in material into like a metal to make it stronger like the ridges in a tin can make it stronger as a tin can. I assume that in your composites, you could also do those sorts of things to even up the strength. 
if in aerospace they like to do this because you can have multiple things integrated into single parts, which is really clever. Yeah, that sounds that sounds great. Um, so we've got all sorts of things that are that are fascinating about this process that really give it some opportunity to do some cool stuff. And so this is a, a lovely diagram for all the different layers that it might take to do vacuum bagging, where you'd have some sort of a mold. This is not drawn to the, the one that I made. Um, but in, in here, you've got a mold, and then you'll need some sort of a release surface so that your mold does not get bonded to the epoxy in your composite, whether that is mold release the spray or a plastic film that is going to resist the epoxy also any of those sorts of things to keep the mold and composite separate. Then you'll need to have a peel ply or release ply for the same basically to be true on the top of the, the composite material if you're talking about epoxy and fabric. So you'll want something there. We have perforated release film, which I can pull out of a box over here behind me in a few minutes. And that's basically another plastic that won't bond to the epoxy, but it's got some holes in it. So that if you have extra epoxy, you want a place for that to go. You want it to not be like squished down onto your, to your tool, your mold. You'd like it to go up into that next layer, up the bleeder and the breather. And that's like a, basically it's a felt that gets put in right between the, the peel ply and the bagging film. And that felt is there so that early on in the process, it gives the air a way to come out from all over the, the vacuum bag. So air can be pulled through that felt without much of a problem. And then later on, as most of the air is gone, that becomes a place for the extra squeezed out epoxy to go. So it'll go through the holes in the perforated release film and it'll start to fill up the epoxy or the, the bleeder and breather. And if I can pull this up for just an example, this is, and I, I know this probably isn't great, uh, but on here, you can see there's some little circles and dots in some places, more over on the right. Those are where the perforations come through and the epoxy sort of pulled through into this white felt that is the breather. So the breather, and we'll, we'll go through those layers a little bit later to see what they all are. We're gonna demold that and sort of di diagnose what happened there. Um, but you've got all these different layers that have different jobs. You've got the release valve, which is right here. This is where your vacuum actually comes into the bag. And so you can attach it to a hose right there. And there's, there's several layers. This is definitely, a practice that's kind of interesting. And looking at this diagram, it doesn't immediately make sense. But if you stare at it for long enough, you do one or two and it'll, it'll, be, it'll feel more natural than to try and decode what these colored lines are. Uh, it's definitely one that there's sort of a muscle memory to doing this. I was surprised how much it came back after several years. This, however, is a fantastic video. If you wanna see it happen in a professional shop with, um, trying to make, I think they're making bicycle parts for this, but that's carbon fiber fabric and then epoxy. This is totally a video that's worth watching on here. I'm just gonna click it and hit and mute it. I don't wanna play all of their audio, but it's a neat process where you can see you've got this fabric stuff to start. That's what carbon fiber on dashboards looks like in it's more raw form as a fabric. And then they hop through, they mix epoxy and then he's sort of mushing it down into the material so that you get a good impregnation of the fabric with epoxy. And then hopping on to the end, sort of leaving it through up here. You can see there's the breeder bleather and here's the peel ply is what he's doing. He can go through putting these layers on top. So there's the breather fabric that he's using that won't stick to the epoxy. And then uh, there's the, the breather that goes on top. And then all of that, he just slides into a vacuum bag where the vacuum pressure can hold all of that together and right up against the mold so that you can see all of that vacuum or that air get pulled out. And it, the air pressure, the 15 pounds per square inch that we're normally living in can be used to press all of that in tight to the mold that's there. So it's a really neat procedure uh, that can be used to make parts that are otherwise gonna be really hard to make. And so he also goes through and says, this is the surface finish. You might get little imperfections, but he was recommending ways to, to patch that because this is a, they're trying to sell a product to you in this video. Uh, and then coming along in here, there's also, you can look at different ways to do it, different looks to it. So different fabrics give you different looks. And then at the end, I think he goes through a few other things, but there's tons of different ways to see and understand this, to look at it. There's lots of opportunity to learn 
but there's there's a lot of things to consider that go along with it. So there's what what fabric do you want to use? Burlap, linen? Uh, do you want to do carbon fiber? Do you want to do something else? Do you want to have uh, some sort of what epoxy do you want to use? Do you need it to be food safe? Do you want it to be the strongest possible type of, type of epoxy? There are just about as many things to think about here as there were back in molding and casting, where there's a seemingly infinite number of combinations that you can work your way through. Um, then you want to think about how do you want to vacuum bag? Do you want to use mold release or a plastic film? Oh, like there's more questions than answers here at first. And your first composites, I would say, you should not try and shoot for the moon. You want to have something that exists rather than try and nail it on the first try. Uh, and so there's, there's lots of things to consider. And maybe you even want to put a filler between layers. So if you want to have multiple layers and stuff in between, that, that could be possible. One thing that you want to consider with your mold is that same overhang problem that we had with uh, molding and casting a, a few weeks ago, where you want to make sure that your molds won't lock whatever they're casting inside them. You need some pliability. And then there's some good advice. Like you want to make sure that if you're doing this, you prepare everything you can before you mix up the epoxy. And anybody who's done an epoxy project so far has definitely learned that that is true. Anything that you can do before part A meets part B, you should do it before part A meets part B. Bobby reminded me of that kindly when we did this on, uh, on Tuesday, I think it was. Yeah, and so there's many of those pieces that you can take into account. Do anything that you can to minimize wrinkles if that's a goal that you have. You can pre-cut your release film, your breather, all of those sorts of things to sort of fit. Get your vacuum bag ready as much as you can in advance. Do all those sorts of things that you can. Make sure that the vacuum is like ready to go, that it's not you know half disassembled or that it's all prepped and ready. And then even what I've found is good is to do a practice dry run with no epoxy of like, okay, I wanna lay this layer and this layer and this layer, just so that you've done it once and you're not trying to figure it out in the moment is always helpful. So those are definitely pieces of advice if you're trying to do this on your own, if you're going deeper into how to make a vacuum bagging setup work for you. You wanna try all of these, but most of the time, the thing that people really are looking for is to try and minimize wrinkles so their pieces can look as nice as possible. If you want that glossy clean finish, like they had in the bike parts that we just saw, you're gonna definitely go to some effort to make sure that it's a very smooth first coat. So, what are other ways that you can do this? This is an interesting opportunity is mechanical compression. When I did this a while ago, this guy named Paul, who I know this guy, I was there when he did this. You, another way you can do it instead of a bag is mechanically compress the layers together. And so he's using a press. Uh, I think it's an 11, it, it's a big press. I don't know, the capacity is there written on it, but I can't quite read it. Um, it's a very high capacity press and he was using foam to hold those pieces together just pressing them without needing the complexity of a bag or the vacuum, as long as you could just keep that press compressed, the, the actual you know, piston thing compressed and down. This is, simplifies some pieces of it. You, you need a tool for the top and bottom in that case, but if you're designing it wholesale, that might be not a problem, right? If you're, if you're really designing this thing and it's gonna work out just how you want it, it could be that that's a relatively easy game, especially if you're gonna CNC the, the molds out of foam like he did, or if you want to build them out of whatever. Um, there's, there's plenty of opportunity for these things to work and mechanical compression can be a nice way to make the whole process just a little simpler. All he had to worry about was putting a release film on the top and bottom molds. You can see he's got some spillover release film here. And then he just put epoxy between his layers of burlap and that was it. I can't remember what he made, but he, he had a winery. And so I'm, most of the projects that this guy did were all to make his winery better, better in some way. Fascinating guy, I, miss, I should reach out to Paul. But uh, he did some great work with this. And mechanical compression is another neat way to make things happen. Um, let's see. For vacuum and fusion, this is a professional level thing. And this is something that is gonna happen more on a big scale. It's gonna be hard for us to pull off, but I feel like you should see it just to see sort of the scale that it exists at. This is when you take your epoxy and, and you have a vacuum pull it through the material that you'd like it to be in. This, this, I assume, boat down over here with the little guy down in the corner is a good example of scales that you can hit with this. This is where if you wanna have an entire car's hood. Um, this, that's kind of what that shape looks like to me as a car hood, like for over an engine. 
you could take something like that and build in a system so that you're very tightly controlling how the epoxy flows through it. Those sorts of things lead to really cool applications and you can get interesting things. There's fun videos of that to watch online, but that takes a, a whole different level of engineering than what is typical for a, a, a beginner project. Uh, but it, it's really neat. Uh, Bobby, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Have you ever done one of these? Yeah. He's saying yes. Oh, that's resin transfer molding. This is vacuum assisted. Tools on both sides, closed cavity and the fabrics in there. And you pull a vacuum on the cavity, the space, and then it sort of sucks it out through here. It pushes the vacuum, it pushes this in and the, the vacuum kind of pulls it out. Oh, it uses pressure. Never mind. It uses pressure to shrink the bubbles, which yeah. is really neat. It's like the pressure pot. That's sort of like the pressure pot version of molding and casting with epoxy. Right. You're just trying to establish a pressure differential. Cool. Uh, so vacuum, you want a pressure difference. Push one so oh, that's a good point. So. Gotcha. So. These pressure ones, you can get a real low void content because you can press really high pressure. Whereas these vacuum assisted, you can only do like one atmosphere. So you can only pull so hard with those, which is why they probably have these strips that run along. You can only make it so far in those setups. So there's a, there's a ton, like this, this is something that's interesting to know exists. It's neat to know that it's there, um, but it's gonna be hard to initially achieve here until you're already you know, it just takes more equipment, more setup. This is. Yep. Yep. So in, in your progression, a wet layup is a good first starter. And then once you're past the wet layup, it would to repeat, then it's to do the vacuum bagging on top of a wet layup. And then this sort of thing is, is the next step after. So how, how do you do this? How do you get started? That's a, a great question for us. We're gonna try and start off people with wet layups that look, that look mostly like this. To make a fabric bowl out of any fabric that you like. I mean, certainly you can do anything that you want. We're not saying this has to be what you do this week, um, but this is something that feels tightly within scope that you could do either just a wet layup like this, and we have some epoxy that you can use to make that happen. And then we could even do a vacuum bag assisted one if we think that that's going to work well, uh, if we're looking for all those sorts of, if those pieces will work out. I think that there's also plenty of designs to make these happen. You know, if you're, if you're staying at home for any number of reasons, I think that you can do that with glue and starch. And there's a few ways to make a bowl that's that's not epoxied, but it is still definitely a composite material on some sort of a level. Uh, but you could do this with concrete and rebar. You could go to the extreme effort of making your own plywood. You could do micarta stock, which is really, which is really cool. I was in Target maybe two weeks ago. This is about as often as I ever get to Target. And I saw a, a stack of construction paper and really started to think about building a colorful micarta piece, which is epoxy impregnated paper just layered on top of each other to do like a series of paper things. And then if you imagine sort of CNCing with a V-carve bit through that, you'd get a color rainbow that comes through when you go at different depths. And that would be really, really cool. Uh, there's all sorts of potential for things like that if you build a, a micarta stock. Then there's the fiberglass carbon fiber layups and vacuum bagging to a mold. Fabric bowls are what we're gonna try and do in that space. We, we bought some dollar store bowls. Um, and there's definitely some opportunity there. If you wanted a different shape, a plate would be nice and easy. There's, there's tons of ways to make that happen. Uh, but then there's also mechanical compression layups are a pretty approachable first. If you, if you wanted to do that where you're pressing from two sides with, with matching tools, that's also something that could be done relatively easily as a starter sort of option. With, with a, by tool, I mean a shape that you've cut that is meant for the pressing. 
So not like a wrench kind of tool, like a cut tool, uh, a form tool. So matching form tools for that would, would be what you need. So, and there's lots of ways to make that, right? You can make it out of foam or mine is out of wood. I have, a, this is a tool that's made out of pine. And so you can make those lots of different ways to try and get this all to work. Vacuum infusion is probably too much. What's up, Kate? Mm. Yeah. Oh, the question is, should, should you avoid or go for certain materials? From what we learned from Julia, I think definitely avoid sulfur clay because that could interfere with the setup of the epoxy. And so there's, there's some tips like that. Uh, I have personally used foam and I know that that worked well. This is pine, which we hope is gonna work well. Fingers crossed, we still haven't opened this composite that we made earlier in the week. And so there's, there's a whole host of things that you could use as a way to make that tool. Uh, and really ultimately, I think as long as it will hold the shape while the epoxy cures, you should be fine. Yep, and you want it to be a non-porous surface, which is why we had to seal, we had to seal my wood in the last moment with urethane so that it was non-porous because wood fundamentally is a porous material. So we needed to have that, that mix. The styrofoam that I used had a plastic release film. And so even though the styrofoam is sort of like dancing a border for porous material, by putting a plastic release film on top of it, the plastic made it non-porous, right? So even if the styrofoam, the foam sort of was, and it was that pink insulation foam you can buy at any big box store for in a house, the like sheets of it. Um, and that is sort of porous. Having the sheet of release ply kept it so that that didn't matter. So it, it, there's several variations to that. But this is, these are sort of the things that are reasonable and within scope. And there's lots of opportunity for you to get creative with composites. We just wanted to have something that would be like a, a fun to do activity that we could all do together. The hope is that if, you know, if we can get a working test of it, of making bowls with a vacuum bag, uh, hopefully we can get like a more, we can have a more structured time later this week. The one thing about vacuum bagging is that you'll need to set up the vacuum to happen and then let it have the entire cure time of the epoxy. So we'd have to, like, if we came in Thursday to do it, let's hypothetically, then we, someone would need to come in and turn off the vacuum on Friday. And then we could all go through the process of demolding those whenever, whenever you got a chance. You just write a name on yours and go for it. What's up? Oh, well, then there we go. So if thir Thursday could be a good day for it because Kate's in on Friday. And so Kate could turn off the vacuum and sort of slice it up into however many bowls there are. And so in my head, I was tentatively thinking of saying, as long as we could make sure that things work today, we'd be able to be ready for Thursday. That feels like the way, to, perhaps the way to go after it. But if any intrepid uh, doers want to try it while we're here tonight, we could also probably make that happen. What's up? Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the mold, the tool should in theory be able to be reused um, because the bowls that we picked are tapered in such a way that they wouldn't mechanically lock. So you, there's enough of a draft angle, you should be able to pull it off without having to like destroy the bowl in any sort of a way. And, and in theory, fingers crossed, that's how it works. We're just a little nervous about my tool with the wood. Uh, the urethane may come off, the mold release may not work the way it works. This, this may, you know, if it didn't work out the way we want, this may end up being a one-time use tool. We'll just, we'll just see, like that's, that's part of how this goes. Um, and so we're gonna try and play around with these different things to see what's the, what's the best option. Um, let's see, question just answered. Yeah, is the, the bowl reusable? It should be. And so in, in theory, the nice part is that we, this may be another class that spins off from foundations or like you can imagine, oh, come in on a Saturday and we're gonna do a vacuum bagging class where we have this set of Corel wear bowls and, and you just make little fabric ones that go on top of it. So we're, we're making all sorts of moves. Um, what I've got is the vacuum bag thing that's right here. I can stop, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. This is my last slide. And then what I want to do is to 
take a look at what's going on. All right, so we've got in, in here, we should be able to, let's see, I'll pick you up. All right, so this is a past repair that I did. Uh, let's see if I can show the camera. That middle white spot there. Um, you guys can see it. So when the, when the laminate gets cracked, it's no longer watertight, and if you get water into the foam, it'll spew laminate and ruin the board. Um, so this, there was a big, big ding right here. Um, so this is Dremel to cut that bit of glass out, and then you need to have a composite uh, you mix micro balloons or microfiber with the epoxy, uh, and that's a good way to pick an epoxy so that you can form it into shapes. So that, that's not just in surfboards, but in, in anything, like if you're just trying to form a shape, you can put fillers in your epoxies to change the viscosity of it so you can uh, make shape. And then I sand, you sand that down after, and then cut a piece of fiberglass that goes over that. Uh, I use two layers of fiberglass, and then I do a wet layup over that, um, sand that down a little more, and then a, a hot coat. Uh, you can see on this board the importance of surface prepping. I only expected to hot coat this area, and then I got a little excited and, and hot coat everywhere, and it kind of beat it up. Like the uh, the epoxy likes itself more than it likes my surface, so you can see it. It looks like a water beating up when it, it should lay down flat, but that's. Uh, Cool, live and learn. Yep. Um, so today I'm going to glass right here. I did a, a ding repair right here and right here. Um, so I have surface prepped it, so I've sanded it. I just hand sand it. And then I uh, did a solvent wipe to clean off any of the dust. So I used acetone to wipe off the surface to make sure that it's ready for bonding. Um, so after that, let's go and mix up some epoxy. Cool. While while you do that, I'm going to talk through demolding mine. There's some most people I think have mixed up a little bit of epoxy. We're just going to do this so that you can get as much experience as you can in as condensed an amount of time as possible. Is really what we're going for. So let me turn this microphone around. And if anybody at home can unmute and tell me if you can hear me, that'd be great. Let's see, can you hear me at all? Is that I all? can hear. Okay, great, perfect. Okay, so this is the thing that, the mold that I made and you can see across the surface, this was a piece of wood. This is a little cavity where I can stick my finger into. I can definitely feel that there's some different layers that you want. These dots that are sort of glared out these are the holes in the perforated ply where epoxy can wick up through. This is the felt that is the, the breather. And all I, I should be able to just use scissors and just cut this open to get into this plastic, which is really actually pretty exciting to be able to cut into here and see, see what happens from all of it. The bags are not reusable at all, no. And yeah, it's, it's just some nylon plastic. So we're doing this, we cut through to try and get this all open. And there's a fair amount of scrap material that's gonna be used on this. It's not like you're, for us, it's not like you're trying to maximize your efficiency. Cutting through. This is the, the breather valve, the bleeder valve. And in here we've got, it's one piece is inside the bag. There's a little hole that we puncture right there. And then this goes through so that you can have your vacuum go into the bag, which is really helpful. The breather is really, it's really just a felt. Like that's all it is. It's nothing too fancy beyond that. It's really just a piece of felt. This plastic is just nylon. The yellow stuff is a vacuum tape. So it's, it's sort of like a thick, almost a putty 
sort of thing that you put in there and it can handle the vacuum pressure just fine without any problem. And then in, it's like a putty sort of, it's, a, it's not like tape, like you'd put masking tape together. Um, and then the next piece is to go through and actually do the demolding or we can take this nylon layer and pull it off. It may not come off all cleanly in one shot, that's fine. And then you can see it still looks like it's hardened, but that's the epoxy in the bleeder breather. And so we can pull that up. You can see when air gets underneath it, it definitely has a look to it. And that's epoxy just inside the breather. It's got that sort of rigidity. It also feels like opening a present. So it's, it's a lot of fun that way. And so you can do this and watch as it goes through that middle. You can sort of pull this up. I don't know how that's going in there. We'll, we'll see. Um, and so trying to release this all the way around. Yeah, that'd be helpful. Whoop. Okay, I think that we have mostly got it. If you're watching at home, <laughs> this is the yeah. So this is what you're seeing is actually this is a linen and a dress shirt that was completely impregnated with epoxy. This is the peel ply that's here. So if we were to zoom in and look closer, it's probably really hard to see, but there's little holes. You can sort of see them on there. There's little holes all across this piece of plastic. Oh, the, dots. That, the little dots, that's where the epoxy actually goes through the plastic into the bleeder breather. So it's there and it comes up through and it, that's what makes the thing that I just peeled off so rigid and hard, but hopefully most of it stayed inside of the fabric to keep this as hard as possible. And so this is the sort of thing that like nobody would want this on the side of their airplane. For us, it's not that big of a deal. Um, for, for me and this, this particular project goal, I just wanted to make sure that we saw it. And then in theory, I should be able to remove this whole thing from the piece of wood altogether. And then we go from there. Uh, yeah, but it's, it's totally like just a rigid piece of epoxy at this point with some, with fabric in it. And you want to have the, what's the, you said you want about the same fabric epoxy. Well, you want more fiber volume content is what we're trying to match. Yeah. So the higher the fiber volume content, the better. Yeah. So basically, as much as you can get the fiber to be there instead of just epoxy, that's that's what you're going for. You're trying. You would be surprised at how little epoxy you need, especially in like a wet layer. You're really just trying to get the fabric wetted out and, and not really any extra epoxy. Like a, a half a solo cup would be enough. I I mix up way too much. Um, <laughs> Not a whole lot of epoxy will get you all the way to the finish of this. And so that's the goal. With that, I want to stop and let Bobby get back to what to what he was doing. So I'll turn the mic his way and like pull this away so we're not making noise on top of him. So Bobby is using his total boat epoxy, doing a pump system where it's a five to one mix. Is it five to one by the pumps? Yeah. Oh, he's got the swanky setup. He brought this in from home. That's that's his level of commitment in case you're curious. <laughs> and so he's he's got the gloves, proper stirring when you're, as always, when you're mixing epoxy, you wanna make sure that you're fully mixing it, uh, that you scrape the sides and the bottom. He's got what looks like a thin layer across the bottom of the, the container, not a whole lot. You can see over here, he's gonna show off. There's not, can we look down into the thing? It doesn't look like it's got much of a color. It's maybe slightly yellow, but yeah. but not, you know, nothing. There's, yeah, so that totally will work. Over here on the surfboard, he's got these fabrics that he's laid down, but it looks like he's just going through and laying the epoxy right on the surfboard and then maybe going to come back by with the fabric. 
and spreading it out, just trying to give a nice thin coat across the surface, trying to make sure it's as little epoxy as you could possibly have to do the job. The theme is to try and keep your epoxy as, as small an amount as you can. People. Like you'd imagine sand, but but you probably don't want sand in there. <laughs> the worst thing to do is to make tiny sandpaper. It's smooth silica bean. Oh, so it looks like you're gonna set it on edgewise. That looks slick. Question in the chat for me. Oh, question in the chat. Do you need to be uh, do you need to be thinking about the heating and thermal aspects of the epoxy when sealing things with it? Um, Bobby looks deep in contemplation. Um, I think yeah, if you mix too thick of it, it, it and you, it'll start curing after a little while, and then it'll, it'll get hot. Yep. So you want to make sure that you have not too much all in one area, because if it starts to get hot, reactions start to go faster when you heat them up, and so it turns into a sort of a thermal runaway. You can even get some smoking if you're going to have a, if you have a big problem. The, and that, that was true in our other epoxy. Aaron, what's up? Oh, I just said, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> you just don't like the usefulness of that stamp. I had a five gallon pail run away on me once. A five gallon pail? That's yes. a lot of it. Uh, <laughs> so that was like fire department and stuff. Oh, fire department for a five gallon. <laughs> You yeah. can, once that reaction starts, you can't stop it. You get it, you get it outside, and you get everyone away from it. <laughs> you get it outside, you get people away. It takes a lot of times. Did it actually start a fire? Uh, no, it just smoked really bad. No, but still, you don't want people in and breathing it. Yeah. The good news is the epoxy that we bought has a one hour pot time, so you do have a pretty long amount of time. It's nice to have a little bit more chill. It also means that the reaction itself, once even once it kicks, it's still going to proceed fairly slowly. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to, you're hopefully, it's a good starter experience. You have to spend longer with the vacuum running, which can leak oil if, you know, things aren't, if all the stars aren't aligned. But it should make the experience a little bit better for a beginner that you've got a longer pot time to make it happen. In but, Pre-cutting and all that still helps. Does that have to be special kind of fabric? Um, this is this is a fiberglass fabric that you're using, right, Bobby? Yeah, yeah. I don't know the weight of it, but um, yeah, it's just glass, fiberglass. And fiberglass, some people like one of the things that people know about fiberglass is that it's bad to cut, um, but that's cut under power tools. This fabric, when you cut it with scissors, doesn't really pose much of a risk. It's bad to air, like to turn into a gas that you breathe in. That's bad for your lungs. Um, but if you're cutting fiberglass sheets like this with scissors, it's not a problem at all. I mean, certainly if you ate it or any of those things, you'd have a problem. But it's not, it's not inherently unsafe. Like if you were to try and if you were to try and touch this up with an angle grinder, you'd have a big problem real fast. <laughs> All right, so just trying to get this off of here. The good news is it's like stuff I don't even want at all. So if I have to do unspeakable things to that, it's fine, we can, we can just get rid of it. The real goal is to try and get it off of here. And so this is, Holding a casting table, like the way we do now. And it looks like the bottom is fine. And this is okay. But there, there's definitely some epoxy in the wood that caught it. And so we're going to have some places where, like, this is totally epoxy right on the table forever and always. So that, you know, we win some, we lose some. It's definitely how this goes. So, you to pull it and see if there's anything. I did urethane the top surface and all the sides. 
So it might be that I get really lucky and I just have to cut along here to sort of release that because it gives me the same for one. But in lots of these places, if I get an exacto knife, it feels like it feels like that is gonna come up with a little urethane and mold release. It looks like it's drawing the time and most of it's come off. Yeah, it looks like it's getting ready to come free. I can get fingers underneath there. And grab into the so this is definitely a step through. One of the things that I had to do with my last one is burlap, many layers of burlap and resin. So I had to take it to a fan to cut through it. This is what we do here. So depending, like I could cut through a city wall. There's some some setups you're gonna have really intense moments where it's where it's just gonna kids the last in a way that's just pretty wild. Like maybe we can get one of these to work. Yeah, it might be that I run this through the bandsaw and just take off as much of that as I can. I mean, even belt sand right here because the epoxy will process like wood. If you know, if I had really nailed it on this, it could just pop off, and it's coming off fairly well. There's definitely some more fighting this than you can mold in other things. But like across this edge, it's coming off fairly well. So yeah, we're. And is that uh, fiber glass? No, this is totally just linen and, and a cotton. Okay. Or cotton dress shirt. So it had the button four off in a way that would have been a pain in the past. So like it's just it's just fabric. So that if you've got a really cool fabric that you absolutely love, you can make it into something that's just rock solid. That's a structural piece. Or imagine when you have a, a boring plywood chair, you do a wet layup of like a fun fabric or fossil surface. Now you've got a, a crazy fabric looking piece of wood. I mean, you probably get this translucent through it, but you still like it's really cool. So when do you need, like you mentioned the chair, when can we use the vacuum? The vacuum is for like that was to keep it right up against the tool. Like especially in the middle here, I got some surface features that I really wanted to have. And so I wanted to have all of this detail get captured from the tool. In the case of a surfboard. There's no like fine features that you go in for, right? There's no like mine has a couple places where I want screw holes, I want a little depression, I want a scale in here. So there's some really fine details that make the hole really valuable. The vacuum also is it like compacted so that uh, you have a higher, you have less extra resin. Yep. And so it compacts it, so you have less extra resin, keeps your fiber to resin ratio closer to the fiber size. But it's good to see. So here's the different materials. So this is the box that came in. So these giant, these giant rolls. This is the bleeder breather. And if you take a look at, sorry, if you take a look at that, it's really just felt. This one is the um, the breather plastic. And it's good to get a look at these when they're not marred. So we'll, we'll open them up. This is like a cat heaven. Oh, it's, it's, it's for sure a cat heaven. If you come take a close look at this, you'll see the little perforations all across it. It totally looks like a gardening fabric. It needs to be, it's the same, it's in the same family as like a Teflon because it has to not bond the epoxy. But this will sit on, like this sat across the top and it let the epoxy lead up through those little holes for the vacuum. And you could see this would help let the epoxy release and it would let air come out through these holes. Whereas this one is the vacuum bagging stuff. This one is the vacuum bagging stuff. And it's really, you know, it's it's nylon. It's important that it has a high stretch capacity. Like it can stretch to 500% its normal size, which is important for when you've got depressions like my pocket here. But that's really the only special thing about it. Otherwise, what's up? You make the vacuum truck? Yeah, you make the bag. And so I cut out a square that was, or I cut out a rectangle. There was enough to make an envelope all the way around my part. And then you use 
the seal tape to make the edges of the back. So you're you're doing that. And when you watch the video, which I would totally recommend pull up when we're not recording, um, you can watch him make the bag out of just a sheet of plastic that's sort of folded over and the vacuum tape is what makes the seal. Sort of like in a Ziploc bag, one of the sides is a fold and the other three are all heat treated to the seal and stuff. And in this case, it's the vacuum seal tape that closes the other three sides. Bobby, what you doing over there? acetone to clean off the epoxy right, that you're, where, you don't want it. where you don't want it to clean off all the excess fibers where you don't want it and that's because the acetone sort of eats through the epoxy as you're as you're going it's going to interrupt the chemical process also i just have to say i love that surfboard stand that was CNC'd very clearly with dog bones and designs that's certainly in the make something big category. It's so simple but functional. I'd like why can you put the board in a few yeah. different positions? Yep. And very quickly um, hold it down and free. Yeah, it's real. And then it looks like you could even use it upside down if you wanted to. Yeah, you can throw boards inside. Did you design it? Yeah. That's real clever, Bobby. <laughs> That's all right. We'll still say it was you. <laughs> if you did the design work on the files, you designed it. That's what I feel like. Not to say that there aren't great inspired designs. Next. Oops. Yeah. No, from here, it looks like, like you can slightly see it, but it really has just disappeared into the surface. Yeah, like it's all just gone. What a neat. So, so this would be a really difficult space to vacuum. Yes. But what was that office look like? What was the benefit of vacuum? Like you don't have weird concepts, or is that you would be able to draw the little extra little red half of the edges? Yeah, higher as a one. We do. Some places do do vacuum bags to make full boards, but most of the time it's just like a layup. Yeah. Last one, last one, last one. Buy your jacket. Your litter bag. Yeah. yeah. And the uh, and contour. Like you can, both of those are true. The wet layup is a great. Is a great way to get started. The vacuum bagging is a neat process for its own. What was the question exactly? So, do you place that fabric where you store it in the coffin? Yeah. Are you going to put that, leave that there, or are you going to remove that after? Yes, yeah, so that, that fabric is fiberglass, and that's, that's what the surfboard is made out of. Yeah, so it's going to stay in there. Cool. All right. I feel like we've Bobby is still going and we can probably continue this for forever, but let's do, let's switch over and do our show and tell. I don't want to miss out on the, one of the most fun parts of class. So I feel like show and tell is a big thing. And, and I've pretty much already done my show and tell. Bobby has done his show and tell. And so if anybody in the room or at home would like to do a show and tell of what they were up to this week, you can walk up to the microphone, show us what you did. You could share a screen. You could unmute yourself if you're at home. Any and all of those are true. So. Cool. Uh, into the foundations channel. Cool. That sounds that sounds good. I can get that pulled up in a second. Ruby, would you will you have yours that you can just hold up? If you want to come up here and I'll point the camera at you and you can you can show us what you're thing is all about. Hi. Um this 
is what I made. It's tiny, it's not big. Um, it's a sign for people to take off their shoes when they get to my house, so I don't have to ask people. Um, and I made it completely in decar, um, and it was it was really fast to make. Um, I, a lot of uh, some help from Corey, um, but the entire like mounting this on the putting this on the CNC like and like preparing everything uh, on the computer on Linux there was all like me solo um, and Lila was was there too. Um, there's some video somewhere that I don't have in this moment, um, but it took I think about 10 minutes. Um, and I, I'm not ready to cut something through use it with a big sheet of plywood. I, I want to um, get more comfortable in Fusion 360 with constraints. I think that is, that's going to be the most helpful way for me to get a consistent, a, a really structural piece of furniture that I want to make for my living room. But um, there's still like things I need to figure out how to do before I get there in a way. So I know how to use the CNC machine. I'm really proud of that. I'm really excited about that. But um, there's a preparation that I still need to, to learn beforehand. One being Fusion 360, another being um, VCarve itself. Um, and also planning the actual piece of furniture that I want to make. I'm not, I'm not done with that yet. Like I'm still in my planning stages. So I have my end, like the CNC badge and all that. I just need to like start from the beginning. That's it. Cool. Very nice, Ruby. Uh, and it's it's neat. There's whole there's a whole bunch of things. It was JR shared, I think it was, about some app. If you want to build specifically a chair where you can like draw in and it, it like I think it's called string chair maybe, where it does a lot of the weird CNC constraint stuff work for you. It's totally a link in the foundation chat somewhere. String chair, I want to say. I opened the website and then immediately forgot. I said, oh, that's cool. I've been forgotten. Sorry, um, but it's in there somewhere. But you just like draw in, you just draw in the vectors and it does dog bones and tolerances and all that for you, I think. I think, having, having never made a chair from it, it's a new to me resource. Um, I also um, worked on my table bed um, redo because the, the epoxy table, though really beautiful, um, it's, it's bigger and it's very heavy and um, I think by the time I put food and other stuff on it, it exceeds the weight of the stand it goes on. Um, plus it's just, you know, it's not pleasant to, I want something that's quick, light and easy to, to make. You know, when I break down the bed, I, I want all of this to be very easy for me. So um, I redid the table, which I have no pictures of right now, but um, well, cool. Well, that's, that's exciting. Very nice. All right. And anybody else? Uh, Aaron, I can see your camera's on. Would you like to unmute and talk sure. to Sure. Sure. So um, uh, I, I got badged on the Gerber machine with, uh, with a few other folks from, from the group. And it was a phenomenal experience. I, I actually even dreamt about it, which was really strange. I don't think I've ever dreamt about a, a tool in my life. Um, but like just wanting the desire to remember all of the steps. Now, I think it's just a matter of, of putting it into practice and starting humbly. I think that, um, Ruby put it perfectly that like in the beginning, I was like, oh man, like I could use this open desk file and, and make something really rad. Uh, but the more I keep thinking about it, the more I'm like, I want to make something that's, that's rad for me, not just making a like a, a piece of furniture for the sake of making, making a, a piece of furniture. So I, I need to figure out the little baby steps that are going to help me get there, get get more savvy uh, in, in Fusion 360 and vCarve and and be able to, to better understand what it is that I'm making, because I think that's what's going to help me get the most into it is uh, the ability to, like, I would love to make the perfect nightstand. Um, that would be like a much more meaningful thing to me than um, uh, 
a desk. Like the last thing I need is another tool to work more. You know, I need I need a I need a better nightstand to to help me keep myself uh, organized before I go to bed. So, yeah, I've just had some thoughts about that, but um, I really really enjoyed it. I look forward to using it some more, and I look forward to putting it through its paces with uh, some four by eight sheets of plywood. So, very nice, very nice. Um, let's see, and then we've got in. I think we have four people left. We got Eliana, Kate, Ada, and Lila who could all share. Anybody who wants to can go for it. Okay. Um, let's see if I can do some sharing. Um, yeah. So this week, go big or go home. Went home. It <laughs> did, didn't go great. Um, but some things were, were okay. And that's cool. Um, um, as you may recall, I wanted to make a little free library, so Corey did that, which was great, <laughs> and I watched that happen, um, but I did get the Gerber badge, which was wonderful um, and, and pretty exciting. Um, oh, this was me thinking I had, <laughs> I was going to be able to do this in like one shot. Um, I was wrong. I was very wrong. Um, I struggled a lot with Fusion 360, the gap in between when we last used it and I used it again, it made me realize I need to be practicing this regularly. Um, luckily, Corey was able to jump online and sort of walk me through some stuff. So this is actually my file um, that has tabs and constraints and parameters and all of those great things. Um, so that was a really nice accomplishment. Um, I did some extruding. So um, I only did the one side, um, but I now feel like I have the tools and the hotkeys in my in, in my tool belt to do that uh, a little bit more. Um, so then when I went to cut, I was like, oh, remember this nightmare on the Shapoko? Let's bring it to the Gerber. Um, that didn't work. <laughs> but no. I think I think it could, but it didn't work because one of the vectors was was open and I just did not have the time or patience to add that to my plate right now. So then I was like, okay, I'm going to make this sign that I've always wanted to have in Make Haven, which has the fractions and their decimal equivalents, um, like for measuring and stuff. Um, I, I'm not sure what happened here. You can see that we're like well into the code, line 2000, and it was still working on the H. This is my dry run. And I was like, what are you doing? Like, it's a lot of code for an H. I mean, we started at the bottom corner here. So, um, so then I was like, okay, you know what? I'm not going to engrave. I'm just going to cut the outside of that um, on the Gerber. Um, and so, all right, so it actually goes and it fires up, which is exciting. When you have sound, it sounds like a jet engine starting up, which is great. Um, and then there's that clamp. And so stop that. <laughs> that, didn't, that didn't go great. So I got this. I did this much. Um, Anyway, so as ridiculous as it looks, I really still feel like it was a winning week. Um, I have stuff. I didn't lose my Gerber badge. I didn't break the machine. Um, I got Fusion 360, a lot of practice, um, and VCarve um, worked with. I got it to actually cut and start up, warm the spindle, did all those steps. Um, I didn't crash it or break it or break me. So feeling pretty good about those things. It was an interesting week, and uh, I'm go I'm I'm not giving up on the Gerber. I'm gonna do more with it. Yeah, great job. The I I feel like the Gerber, while it is still, I would still call it a gentle giant. There's so many steps to get it to run, it which become a second nature. It's a thing. It's a definitely a repetition that you get into, and once you've got it, it can be a thing that you just are able to float through like it's a dream uh but yeah yeah a buddy a buddy who has the gerber badge is a really good is a really good plan um it's definitely something that it takes m more practice to get comfortable with but like the like bobby's example thing over here is a is a great oh I just unplugged my camera I think somehow uh, but Bobby's example of a CNC thing is a great example of like 
how powerful that tool can be when put into the right place and application. So it's that's awesome. Okay, and it, it doesn't, we've seen this many times before that a successful week isn't necessarily the, doesn't mean that you made the biggest, coolest thing. It just means that you've made progress from where you are to where you're going. And that absolutely, we want to celebrate that as success, which is exciting. So um, great job. And we've got a few more people. If anybody's got anything to share that you did that was exciting this week. There we go. Uh, the world's upside down. We're back. Okay. All right. Um, we have two in the room, and then there's Lila in, uh, from home. Oh. Oh. Yeah, Lila is sharing. Whoa. Oh, nice. So I made that on the Gerber. Um, it's a little wonky, and I did kind of just pick a, a file that I found online. Um, I just kind of wanted to see what the tolerances were, and it the slots are a little bit too big. I kind of wonder if maybe the toolpath was in calculating for the, I think I used the eighth inch bit. And just when it was ending, it was cutting out that top piece. Um, the board fell out of the clamps. So I had to kind of go back to the drawing file and set it up just to cut the top piece. And I don't know what I did, but can you see that it's not quite centered? <laughs> it's a little bit to the anyone. So um, yeah, it was a it good, good experience. And I ended up, uh, I just went to Home Depot and I bought a $20 um, piece of plywood. So yeah, I, I, I think I learned a lot, even just working with Ruby, um, making her sign and going through the proce process of, you know, running a project beginning to end. When I had to load the piece of wood back after it fell out, I did it all like all by myself and I homed it and was able to run it. So yeah. Yeah, yeah that's that's exciting. You really made a, a real stool there. That's even if it is a little a little um, to use Ruby's word avant-garde. Yeah. A little asymmetric, that's still you made big you made something big. You did it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's exciting. Cool. All right. And then we have some, uh, two, two more people. If you'd like to share, we can do it or yeah. You're okay. You can come on up and chat to the thing. Um, I went and took measurements of the glass window that I'm painting. And that's much more difficult than I thought because I forgot that I needed scaffolding system to paint the top part of the window. And I don't know how I'm going to do that. So I went to Home Depot to ask about renting one and it's ridiculously expensive. I asked about renting a ladder and the, they only have like 10 foot A-frame ladders, which would not work. Um, so I'm probably gonna have to buy a ladder just for this project, which is not what I wanted to do. Um, then I went and I had to buy all the supplies, which they were supposed to be providing supplies um, and then I found out the nature of what they were providing and it's not enough. So I had to spend a bunch of money getting paint and getting uh, things to add to the paint so that it's weatherized so that it can withstand weather, just both sun and rain. You need to take a step closer to that. Oh. Uh, so I have to weatherize it so that it can withstand rain and, and sun um, cause it's going to be on the outside of the window, not on the inside, which doesn't make any sense to me, but that's the requirement. Um, and then I bought a bunch of oil board, which I will be making stencils out of. I don't know if anybody saw the painting of the crosswalk that happened this weekend in front of Elm city market, but they were using essentially a kind of oil board, giant stencils that they were rolling out the paint onto the street. So that's essentially what I'm going to be doing is just like creating really giant stencils that will be taped to the window and then rolling paint out onto the window in like a really thin layer and doing that three times over the course of nine hours. So we'll see how it goes. That's all I got. What kind of ladder do you 
What? What kind of ladder do you need? Uh, I need at least a six foot ladder, but I need to have one that I can stand on the top step because a lot of them you can't stand on the top step. Um, let's, let's talk about this. I might have a solution. Okay. That's exciting. Possible ladder solutions. Very nice. Look forward to seeing the pictures. Um, um, so uh, I didn't get to do my cut this week, but um, I've been prepping to uh, to recut the pieces that I, uh, from my original design for the nightstand I'm working on. And um, I've added a, a few different um, features to the pieces that I think will make assembly a lot easier. Um, and I think it's so it it's it's uh, sixty seven individual pieces I think that uh, I need to cut. Um, so it's going to be a, a maybe like four hours or so, um, but uh, right now right now I'm talking from here instead of my computer because I'm trying to use the computing power to compute some tool pads at the moment. Well, there there you go. That's exciting. How fun! Um, there's. There's tons of options to really see what you can make when you make something big. There's tons of, and, and like, it sounds like we each had our own unique set of struggles. There were two goals, if you'll remember, that was to deal with sort of the problems of working at scale, which is its own whole thing. And then to advance CNC, which is its own whole other thing that just sort of the stars align in a make something big kind of week, which is, which is sort of fun. Or you can get some really dynamic stuff that comes out as a result and and not locking it into just one pigeonhole solution is really cool um i am super excited to see what happens with composites this week i think we're gonna try the uh, this feels like a relative success uh my thing already today so i think on at the very least on thursday we'll have a session where you can make a bowl and then we stop that on friday um, if anybody wants to give it a go for today, I'm in. I'll be here and we can try it. Uh, but we can also wait until Thursday if we just want to calm down a minute and let it let it simmer. Both of those are reasonable options. Um, I do I do want to say that this is this is week 30, 32, I think, of our course. Right out of a 40 week progression. We, this is the sort of the last of the units next week is starting group projects. So we're gonna start group projects then. That's gonna be two weeks of machine design, two weeks of mechanism design. And so that's like four weeks of let's all build a, a robot as a group or a couple of groups. So start to think about if you're interested in a gardening robot to water these plants that are hitting me in the head. Um, if you're interested in doing something else if you wanted to we're thinking about trying to go grab something out of the 3d printer graveyard maybe bring one back to life or to change it into a hot wire cutter cnc there's a ton of options there that would be really cool uh, and if you're unsure we definitely can offer some guidance but you'd have a sort of a month of working on that with people to to meet your goal and then there's three weeks post that that are really we'll we'll still have lessons we'll still do talks like this on a monday but then the time throughout the week would be for you to work on your own individual stuff. Although I'd say it would be sort of a, a moment to start to think about those questions of what do you want a final project to be? How do you want to try and represent the things that you've learned? There's not really any real guide rails on this. and We can add some if we feel like it's helpful. Uh, but as of right now, if you can imagine some project that tries to encapsulate all the things that you learned throughout this entire course to have some ultimate summative hero shot photo of what you did and maybe maybe a short video to explain like what it is and, and what it does or what it what it looks like and how you built it um it'd be really cool to start to think about those final projects but it's it's good to just plant that seed while we're thinking a little bit about um epoxy and composites this week to sort of start to think about what you want your final projects to be if you hadn't already been thinking about it some of you i know have some of you maybe have been just sort of wandering through enjoying yourselves, but now's the moment where you start to think, how, how, do, you, how do you do the thing? I, I'm a big believer in 
when you make something, it's really making sort of your personality manifest in real life when it comes from your design, when it's your work. And so how, how can you encapsulate that personality as a, as a part of you embodied outside of you, uh, maybe to persist longer? And how can you use it also to showcase skills that you've learned? It doesn't need to hit every skill that you've learned. That would, that would drive you crazy. I promise I've tried to do it a couple of times. Uh, but just to showcase, you know, as many as you can touch without trying to derail the project just for that goal. Something that's really interesting that really expresses you in some way and that also starts to explore all these ideas. And there's a huge stockpile of examples from Fab Academy and those are the, the most aggressive high-end example final projects, but they're really cool. Um, so it could be good to look at for inspiration, but it's also good to make sure that you pick something that you think you can achieve in the essentially two months that you have between now and the end. So there's, there's some dynamic and some strategy to think about that with the long game. I'm always trying to keep an eye on the long game with some of these things. And so that's exciting for us to look forward to. Boy, there's a lot that has happened. There's a lot of things to go after. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited to do all this composite business, everybody. It's like fun. Cool.